I could bring up a list of chemicals that are known mm -hmm. to affect the development of the reproductive system. Mm -hmm. And they're chemicals that are found in uh, maternal blood, maternal, uh, in cord blood, in neonates, mm -hmm. in breast milk. Yeah. You run a, a blood test on a, on a U.S. newborn and you will find a, a breathtakingly large array of toxics in their blood. So yes, continuing to put out more is just not, not sensible. Study after study reveals the contamination of our everyday environment with toxic chemicals. Political leaders do little to nothing to prevent it, and the general public remains unaware. two-minute tape I did, I didn't talk about herbicides much, I talked about democracy. You know, and the reason why we're looking for democracy is because that's the only way we're going to affect change. You know, I said it was total lip service to be able to speak at this thing because nothing will happen with it. We, we, we aren't involved in the decision making. In the spring of 2010, members of an electric cooperative gathered to share their frustrations. Hours earlier, at their cooperative's annual meeting, they were not allowed to speak denied the opportunity to express their dissatisfaction, their concerns about the governance of their cooperative, especially the leadership's preemptive decision to spray herbicides without consulting or informing members. Ozarks is an interesting place from the standpoint of being one of the oldest land masses in the world, not subject to flooding or glaciation for 200 million years. That's since flowering plants first evolved on the planet. I like places where I can hunt all day and drink out of the creeks as I go. You know, I don't, don't like to have to worry about what the, you know the guy up the hill is doing. And around here, usually there isn't anybody up the hill, so it makes it easier. Still pretty wild country out here, because we don't have very many people living in Newton County. Less than 10,000 people. About a third of it's public land. You just won't find a prettier place in this part of the country. The way things are more alive and wild out in the country here than they are in the highly developed agricultural parts of Arkansas. What I like about the Ozarks, or what I used to like about the Ozarks, is that there weren't so many people, and that you could actually see the real physical world as it might be, or might have been, before people kind of took everything over. I study traditional and sustainable resource management in the Ozarks. While investigating seed saving practices, farmers informed me of this current herbicide conflict. They felt threatened by the spraying of herbicides around their farms and gardens. Many Ozarkers rely on springs and wells for drinking water. They hunt game and gather wild plants for their food and medicine. 
I felt that the issue deserved further investigation, so I interviewed experts and people affected. I began with Stephen Foster, a specialist on the wild plants of the Ozarks. It's kind of an isolated geological formation in the middle of the country. We have a convergence of floristic ranges here, the eastern deciduous forest, more typical of prairies and glady areas. Important medicinal plants of the eastern deciduous forest, we have ginseng, American ginseng in the Ozarks. For example, I was a keynote for the Catskills Ginseng Festival a few years ago. The wild roots they were bringing out of the Ozarks were like big carrots that took two hands to hold. Echinacea paradoxa, an Ozark endemic, and that means it only occurs in the Ozarks. Medicinal use of echinacea is for upper respiratory tract infections. Over the past 30 years, another important plant has been golden seal. And golden seal kind of emerged as a quote-unquote natural antibiotic in the, the 1970s. When you spray herbicides, you kill plants. That's the purpose of spraying herbicides. There's a whole lot known about how it affects genetically modified soybeans, but there's nothing known about how it affects wild plants in the Ozarks. I convened with local landowners, environmental activists, and wildlife proponents who wanted to attract wider attention to the electric cooperative's herbicide spraying. What is your favorite plant? Uh, probably ginseng or golden seal. I've used both of them at times, you know, and they do definitely work as far as I'm concerned. Well, on my land, I've got a lot of golden seal and a lot of ginseng and a lot of black cohosh and blue cohosh, and so I've got a lot of herbs just that, that are growing right there on my land. Like tomatoes a lot. Uh, mullen. People don't seem to realize that it uh, has uh, two uh, really good uses for me uh, as a backpacker. One is it is an excellent uh, medicinal for lungs, and the other a little uh, uh, on the lighter side. It's uh, if you don't have uh, toilet paper packed in with you, uh, mullen leaves are. Uh, uh, I, I find it to be the most pleasant way to uh, to uh, uh, fulfill that need. The leaves are big and they're very soft. Any hardwood tree that's uh, native to the Ozarks is going to be my favorite plant. And then I came here to the Ozarks because um, of the bugs. They've got the most wonderful bugs here. Uh, we canoe, we hike, uh, we mountain bike. Hunting, fishing, loving wildlife. Bugs with a lot of character, even ticks have character. And the praying mantises and the um, walking sticks, and we don't have that type of stuff where I'm from. Wildlife photography, gardening, kayaking, backpacking, anything that gets me out of a little bitty office and out into the woods. Our economic engines are, are fueled and, and able to exist in the Ozarks because of our abundance of uh, clean water supplies. Arkansas, the natural state. We got rivers, we got lakes. The Ozarks are really known for having these beautiful rivers uh, and uh, beautiful springs and uh, a large number of people that depend on wells and springs uh, for their drinking water. We are trying to protect the water of the Ozarks for ourselves as well as for all these myriad of species. It turned out that many of the people protesting the electric cooperative's use of herbicides had actually been involved in similar struggles for over three decades. We've been working at this for a long time. The Newton County Wildlife Association has been around for 21 years. Some of you probably know how we got started. You know what the Forest Service was doing to get us to form the Wildlife Association? Spraying poison. They were spraying Agent Orange on the Ozark National Forest trying to get rid of a hardwood tree. By airplanes to plant pines for the timber industry. There was an article in the Newton County Times that said uh, in 1975 that the U.S. Forest Service was going to be aerially applying 245T and 24D. 
and they were going to use it on Forest Service land, but there is such a thing as light winds or heavy winds that can cause drift. Between 1961 and 1971, the United States military aerially sprayed over 19 million gallons of herbicides in and around Vietnam to defoliate the dense forest and remove the cover of enemy forces. I did a project in Vietnam looking at Vietnamese ginseng, Panax vietnamensis, which is a rare species. I drove through hours of mountains that to this day are completely defoliated from our spring during the Vietnam War. As a result of exposure to the herbicides, Vietnamese and American soldiers developed serious health complications, which continue to this day in the form of birth defects for their children. Inexplicably, these same chemicals were then sprayed on U.S. national forests. Or maybe there was an explanation. At the conclusion of the war, there was a surplus of herbicides that had not been used and could still be sold, if they could justify a use and a buyer. The U.S. Forest Service could use a powerful herbicide to help them kill off the Ozarks native hardwood mix and replace it with pine monocultures for cheap sale. The Forest Service planned aerial sprays for the Ozarks, disregarding the possible health risks for the people and other species of the area. The Forest Service failed to realize, however, that people in the Ozarks are willing to defend themselves against intrusion. During the 20th century, the Ozarks has continuously attracted a small but active and informed subpopulation of independent homesteaders known as back to the landers. Many live off the grid by choice, grow relatively large percentages of their own food, and follow the Ozark traditions of self-reliance and government mistrust. I came here, I spent two years looking here for land, and uh, I liked the fact that Newton County was the lowest population county in the state. About half of the county was uh, publicly owned either by the National Forest or National Park. What kind of solidified it for me was the fact that there were a number of other people who came into the area about the same time with much of the same philosophies of life and uh, politics. These independent, politically aware Ozarkers came together to stop the Forest Service's plan. In 1975, the Newton County Wildlife Association was established. And so, they acquired a lawyer, and the, uh, the lawyer went to a federal district court. And I don't think the judge realized what a historic thing it was, and he issued an injunction to stop the spraying. And it was the first one in the whole country, and it created a precedent. So then even people out in Oregon and Washington started using this precedent that was started here in Arkansas. So we kept at it. We had reformed the organization, Newton County Wildlife Association, it immediately uh, was contacting the uh, State Sierra Club uh, Conservation Organization to get some help to make this uh, something that just wasn't going to be done at least in northwest Arkansas and the Ozark National Forest. And we actually won that battle. Mistrust of government runs deep in the Ozarks. Local people have continuously been at odds with outsider management of public lands. The Buffalo River, heralded as one of the few remaining unpolluted, free-flowing rivers in the lower 48 states, meanders 150 miles through the Arkansas Ozarks. It became the United States' first ever national river in 1972 at the conclusion of a 10-year political battle that eventually prevented the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers from damming the river. Thomas Hart Benton, internationally renowned artist and native Ozarker, wrote to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. As a lover of the great scenic beauty of the Buffalo River, I would like to add my name to those others which are lined up in protest against plans to put a dam across its waters. Man, hogtied as he 
largely is with the steel tentacles of an increasingly mechanistic world and with the prospect of being tied ever tighter needs some areas of escape of escape to the natural world from which he came he'll need all these and more in the future the buffalo river provides one of these areas i say and i intend it emphatically let the river be sincerely yours thomas hart Benton. Ozarker protests continued in 1989 when the U.S. Forest Service reintegrated herbicide use into their proposed management plans. Hundreds of Ozarkers wrote letters in response, vehemently opposed to the spraying of poisons. To no avail. It's not like they're really wanting any other opinions. It's just that they have to go through the process because they're required by law to do it. That realization came when I asked the forest, the district supervisor at the time, when we write public comments in to you, you have to look at them. He said, yes. He said, but there's nothing in the law or in your management guidelines to say you have to do anything we ask you to do. He said, that's correct. So I said, so we could have 5,000 people write to you asking you not to do something in a particular part of the forest and you could ignore those comments and those desires and do exactly what you want to in your documents. And he said, that's right. Because they have set the rules up to keep your comments from really mattering. That according to the latest EPA papers, this triclopyr is a relatively new herbicide for which very limited toxicity data have been reported. This is the latest from EPA. The precise physiology of the active ingredient is not known. Because the Forest Service ignored local people's responses, the Newton County Wildlife Association felt obligated to hold what they called poison picnics. Our tax dollars pay for the Forest Service to come out here and clear cut, apply herbicides, take the trees off of there, and yet our children get the legacy of having to deal with the trace residues of chemicals and the loss of the prime Ozark uh, highland forest. We had the Forest Service out there once with the supervisor on one of these timber sites in the old growth, and Kent was explaining to them that you have rare plants growing here, and there's ginseng growing here. And the timber manager said, ginseng, I don't see any ginseng. And Kent said, you're standing on one. And he picked his foot up, and there's a ginseng under his foot. <laughs> these, uh, these are both in the ginseng family. This is devil's walking stick here. It's a woody tree. And uh, it gets big like the one behind you there. This is about as big as it usually gets. But we've seen whole clumps of it out here, head higher, bigger in places. I was presenting at an academic conference at the University of Arkansas when I first met Kent Bonner. And I had actually shown his film, The Naturalist, in my regional anthropology course that focuses on the Ozarks. There's a documentary about Kent, and it, it goes into his role as the naturalist for the Newton County Wildlife Association. In that film, they refer to him as the John Weir of the Ozarks. I might say he's more of a combination of Henry David Thoreau and perhaps St. Francis of Assisi. He's like, he's like an ascetic patron saint of the Ozark wilderness. Okay, and they've just cut this road here, and here we are now, right off of the road. Okay, this is an oven bird nest, and it's a neotropical migrant. And they nest right here on the ground in these little uh, ball nests the size of a fist with milking on the side. We expect people in South and Central America to take care of our birds in the winter. We're going to have to take care of their birds in the summer. He spends his daytime exploring the Ozark forests and his evenings writing up his observations for use in policy formulations and as responses to U.S. Forest Service land management plans. In the 1970s, Kent worked for Arkansas State Parks, and he has a vast understanding of such bureaucracies. This insider knowledge allows him to combine legal precedents with his ecological knowledge to protect vulnerable plants, animals, and humans. Gordon Watkins, then president of the Ozark Organic Growers Association, was one of those residents who wrote a letter in 1989 in 1985, all of a sudden people had more fruit than they could can and that they could share with their neighbors. And so we began to look at the Ozark Organic Growers Association as a different sort of organization, more market oriented. And we then began to pool products that various growers were producing. 
We started off shipping to Whole Foods. Everybody knows who Whole Foods is now. At that time, they had a single store, and we would drive from the Ozarks to Austin twice a week. We also sold to every little mom and pop health food store we could find along the way. We kind of grew right along with Whole Foods, interestingly. Herbicide applications are a huge threat to certified organic farmers in the Ozarks. Uh, not simply because of direct applications that might occur on a grower's property. For example, I have power line right-of-ways on my property. And I have assurances from the power company that, that my property won't be sprayed. I'm, I'm not uh, completely assured by those assurances. For all the great advances man has made in improving our quality of life, for all the solutions we've found for problems facing our society, we still find Mother Nature one of our biggest challenges. The ability to distribute electrical power across hundreds of miles or pump oil and gas across our nation in underground pipelines is constantly challenged by Mother Nature. Keeping trees clear of power lines and open right-of-way is a serious and expensive problem. For the next few minutes, we would like to show you why a growing number of major energy producers have turned to a new, more cost-effective solution. How to explain the issue? Uh, you mean you're talking about the herbicide issue? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, that would be hard to explain because to me it doesn't make any sense. Our electric utility just started spraying um, herbicides, I believe at this point four years ago. They cleared manually and mechanically for 70 years before that. It's a deal where people are working on an economy of scale that's totally inappropriate for the landscape. I can't explain it uh, as far as uh, money goes. Uh, if I actually don't want to learn. Uh, why? Because it's probably got something to do with something uh, uh, disreputable. I think it's a big mistake. As early as 2006, Carroll Electric was using herbicides under their power lines. However, in letters to their membership, they never stated that herbicides were actually being applied. Well, my issue was, you know, I got the letter, I got the silly letter, right. and the letter was just such... so. In, you know, so insulting. Trained applicators will be selectively treating the tall growing brush under the electric lines using products that will encourage the growth of grasses and low growing vegetation. They didn't say a word about herbicides. I spent 10 years with Greenpeace US as uh, first as director of the US toxics campaign and then as a research director, which actually was more of what I did. And then I spent 10 years with Greenpeace International and was senior scientist with the science unit. I had a series of nice meetings with Carroll Electric. I've known and dealt with those people for many right. years. They agreed that if people would just call, that, you know, that they would not spray them. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was what I wanted to achieve. Mm -hmm. Some people down in Newton County, including Sean Porter, found that even though they called, that they still got sprayed. Mm -hmm. And that was not good. He had all the manners about him. It was yes ma'am, yes ma'am, everything he understood, yes ma'am, everything I said, but he didn't hear what I said. I went over with him once again the importance of not spraying the farm and the importance of not allowing these chemicals into our water streams and the pollutants that we don't need and that's why I moved up here to get away from all that. Kathy Turner, an organic farmer, had her farm sprayed by a contractor working for Carroll Electric. I went uh, with this crew chief and we went on all the parameters of the farm. He would ass assured me that they would not contaminate this farm. Yes. I'm sorry to inform you, we have sprayed the farm on this, this end. He, I said, well, which one? He said, well, the one that has the horses on it. So I immediately came down here and got the horses off this property. They were grazing it while they were spraying these chemicals. I have a buffer perimeter here set up to avoid problems with spray crews. They spray this area, which you can see has the um, trees burnt on it. They went across this field 
down through this woods. So obviously they sprayed right through here. Yeah, this whole swath. See, I, I was starting a wildlife or a wild crafting plan, harvesting wild crops from the woods, whether it's cedar, herbs, flowers for organic production. I can't do that now. There's three water sources. There's a pond that was just built last year. There was a really nice spring that has been there for ages and ages and ages. And then there's a, a hand dug well that's been there for quite some time. And I would imagine all three of them were contaminated in one way or another from chemical residues that they apply to the fields. I irrigate from a large spring that flows out of the bed of the Little Buffalo River which runs through my property. Uh, the, the river during dry parts of the summer will be dry above there and all the water comes out of the ground. It's a sinking stream. And the water comes out of the ground in my irrigation pool. There are big cracks in the limestone that the water just bubbles up through. That water is coming from, presumably from long distances. Um, there are springs all throughout my, my part of the Little Buffalo Valley. And so my concern is that even if if my property is, is designated as no spray, if my neighbor's property, which has a sinkhole on it, is not designated the same, and that sinkhole gets contaminated with herbicides, which flow into the groundwater, that it's going to emerge in my spring and contaminate my irrigation water, and then I, I, lose, I lose my certification, but more importantly, I lose one of the most uh, important uh, resources that we have here, which is our, our clean water. And so that's a good example, I think, of how, how fragile the groundwater is in, in this karst topography of the Ozarks. Now, topography is just like uh, you could say that table is part of the topography of this room. And karst is cracked limestone under the earth with a thin bit of topsoil. So a karst topography is pretty much where we live. Sinkholes, sinking streams, caves. So it's a three-dimensional landscape developed on and in a rock that can be dissolved, like limestone, dolomite, marble. Pollutants of any kind, car oil, herbicides, pesticides, even gasoline from changing your chainsaw oil or anything that you can think of can easily penetrate into our drinking water without any filtration whatsoever. The underground water system is just as advanced or more advanced than the water system you see here. 40% of the United States drinks water that's in a karst topography. 25% of the world, 1.5 billion people, drink from a karst topography. Me and my dad drink from a spring. Any pollutants here it goes down shafts and into the sinking streams and goes out, it pops out in our spring. The main thing of course is everybody lives downstream. It's pretty simple to understand. It's just the limestone, it's easily dissolved and the water can get through it. I hold national certification as a uh, forester, national certification as a hydrogeologist, that's groundwater hydrologist. My primary focus is subsurface migration of pollutants in karst areas. I've been doing these things since uh, I got my degrees, which was, uh, my master's was in 62. Uh, We're a designated national natural landmark oh, great. because the cave has the most diverse cave fauna of any cave west of the Mississippi. As we go through the cave, um, stay on the trail. I've been in here when we got a very intense rainstorm and the flow rate increased in about 20 minutes after the start of the rain. So clearly you're not getting much natural cleansing for the water if it gets into the groundwater system that rapidly. Yeah. Well, we have the the Tumbling Creek snail and a couple of other snails. Uh, we have amphipods, isopods, uh, salamanders of several species. And you put all those together, including eight bat species, and that gives us the 115 species we have. Losing streams are 
very important, very characteristic features in Ozark karst landscapes. A losing stream is one that loses an appreciable amount of water in a very localized area. Herbicide application in the immediate vicinity of a losing stream segment poses a much greater risk to groundwater quality than does one on, say, a hilltop or a, a hillside. When you initially set up, like, to go document them at Onyx Cave, how did you, you go about setting that up? I just called them and I said, where y'all going to go today? And they said they were going to go to Onyx Cave, and I said, well, great. Well, and I just followed them and took pictures. As you could see, I mean, they were, yeah. they were you know, posing for me effectively, mm -hmm. you know. It doesn't even register in their minds that they're spraying directly over sinkholes that run directly well, into a cave. No. First of all, i got to ask you, well, how do you like the picture over there? That's, the title is, I Told You So. Isn't that cute? And I'm going to give you one little bit of history for the future, and you can quote me on this, but I think we're fixing to learn a lesson. We might have to learn how to darn socks. I was born in northern Wisconsin on the shores of Kichigumi. That's Lake Superior, right there, right there. 1920, it was a good year. And my husband called me that night and said, how would you like to live in a cave? And I said, buy it. Like that, sight unseen. Everybody said, well, I, I want to come and visit you because I know you're, you're living in a cave. Well, I wasn't really living in a cave. I was living on top of the cave. I got my air conditioning from the cave and water from the cave. The water comes up through the handrail when you go into the cave. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it really was, it was a, a good setup. So we have sea poles. And, and if I use the word karst, is that all right? Yeah, it's perfect. This, this is a typical karst situation because it's all caves. Now up there, that's where the water, that's where we pump the water. Do you think that it's different because there are caves, that if you spray herbicides in areas with caves, that it makes a difference? Well, the, the contamination is general. I mean, we're all, we're not, we're not down to the rubidoux. We're up here at the surface. And you, you, can, you can put a, a bottle of bluing in this puddle, and I can find blue water next day in my cave. So this is a matter of just how long it's going to take to seep on through. We are all alerted on what's in our food, what's in our water. Why do you think people are buying water of all things? It's, it's, uh, they, want, they want pure food. And they, they've found out that uh, why do you think I've lived to be 90? Because I got fresh water. <laughs> got it? Do you think this, this herbicide stuff could actually contaminate the water? Oh, bit? yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't, and I'll have to start buying water. That, that'll kill me. Do you buy water? Do you buy water? Do you buy water? He buys water. All the people that I used to have on my Christmas card list from Florida and Wisconsin are all gone. I'm outliving them all. Put two and two together. <laughs> Do it yourself. I don't know. Make it up. I've always lived with my own fresh water. I mean, we, this is something that's just come on lately. And, you know, as I get older, I find things are going to hell faster. You know, if I could push everything back to the good old days, you know, like 1920. Um, I'm a carpenter and a cabinet maker. Actually, what brought me here was the Back to the Land movement. Um, I grew up in San Diego, California, and I was uh, looking for uh, getting back to nature. And uh, the Ozarks provided that. It's an amazing secret that's just starting to get out now, that it's pristine, it's, it's still clean, and it's uh, what we're working on keeping. I do carpentry work out. I've built several houses. I think I'm old school in that it's, for me, it's about quality. I'm incredibly passionate about not using herbicides. It could reflect back to my livelihood if I choose to leave here because of the pollution. I came here because it was so clean. This is our spring. Without it, basically, we couldn't live here. There's no other water supply. We'd have to haul water. So we really want to keep it clean. We, we, we're not interested in it being polluted. 
it does matter what other people do on their property. We all live downstream. It's important that we all pay attention to what we do, and it's important that the bigger players like the power companies not use pesticides in this area because it's a karst region. You know, this is the first environmental activism, if you want to call it that, I've ever been involved in. It's, it's not my forte, it's not what I want to do, but it's in my backyard and it became so obvious and so necessary that it was time for me to, to walk my talk. One of the arguments that's being used for herbicide applications underneath the power line right away is, is that they want to create a, a park-like environment of grasses that will not threaten the, the power lines. I think there are some real concerns about the effect of of the herbicides they're using and how far they reach outside the easements that, that they're treating. With the herbicides, you will often have root grafting. One tree is connected to another tree in effect through the roots. And with sensitive species, you can kill a tree over here in the right of way, and that herbicide will then end up through. going through the root. So it's not just drift that right. can kill them. If the herbicide impacts you know, the roots of the trees on both sides of it, you can see how tall these trees are relative to the line. So you're going to have branches from both sides that are going to be, you know, falling into that line for, you know, years and years. It's just going to increase the maintenance really big until there's no trees left. Then I guess it'll level off. Rural electric cooperatives in other parts of the Ozarks have started using herbicides for their power line maintenance. When Carroll Electric and three other rural electric cooperatives formally requested permission from the U.S. Forest Service to spray herbicides on public lands, the Forest Service's forest supervisor preemptively decided that there would be no significant impact and fast-tracked the decision. The forest supervisor decided that there was no need to consult any experts outside the Forest Service or the electric cooperatives. But they are required to follow mitigation measures, such as training applicators to identify sensitive areas, such as sinkholes and other karst features. Yeah, this is where the rocks hang over the road. Dude, I'm not supposed to spray in creeks. You're not supposed to spray on exposed limestone bedrock, which is karst. And here they did. That's a, a good one to look at. And then, yeah, you, know, you can see they went straight up the hill through there, too. So. Even the Arkansas Department of Environmental Quality reprimands Carroll Electric for spraying in karst. But it continues. Yeah, this is the limestone we're on now. And you can see how it's kind of a different type of rock, it's a little bit more rounded edge. Uh, you know, the spraying is definitely what impacted because everything up here is in good shape. But this is pretty good contrast, just having this one little DMZ swath through the middle of what's, you know, otherwise looks great on both sides. Applying herbicides only when wind speeds are low and no precipitation is in the forecast. Hello? They're on my property. Yeah, he's trying to get me to, I don't know, there's a whole bunch of them staring no. at me. Uh, you've got signs on our pole. Well, if you need to you take them down, take them down. No, that's not my fault. No, it's my wife. Right. Right. No, I said you came out there with a gun. I didn't know. You scared them boys to death. They thought you were going to shoot them. That. There's enough clarity to it to see that there's a tractor with hoses and two guys that are just hosing this right of way. And, uh, you know, he says he's got to report. Well, they he said, well, if they had any problems with me, to report it. Specifically. They said that I can't put signs on the poles. And um, I said, well, I didn't know that. And, and um, That's a big stream. It was such a terrible 
event because they sprayed a hillside leading down to a spring-fed creek that flowed directly into the Buffalo River. This is our driveway. This is from our house going out. This is on the left side of the road. And here's the power line. Right there. Poppy, no. See that? I'm worried about my dog trying to get dr a drink of this water. This is, uh, I think, runoff. And you can see the uh, oily spray they put down right here. It smells really, really bad. And this is on the right side of the road. Poppy! No! I'm sorry, she just drank the water, so I just, uh, and she's pregnant. And his dog drank some one of the puddles, and his dog was pregnant and miscarried all of her puppies within like 48 hours. So they, they basically killed all the beauty down here. And they said there is absolutely no runoff. It sticks to the plants. And then a few days later, the husband's out there videotaping the runoff during a rainstorm. We've got some ferns dying here where the runoff took place. And then their kids walking home from school picking up the signs that are doused with herbicides because they didn't know that the thing got sprayed because they don't mark it in any way. A uh, milestone moderately toxic to honeybees and earthworms and fish, a cord, tordon, power line and arsenal, escort, all of these individually are moderately toxic to pollinators. Now, and in combination, you have no idea what they will be doing, but it will not be good for them. We, you, that's a given. Either I think we're selling our species short, and uh, it, it kind of really gets to me because it seems to me whenever we are selling ourselves short, that we're uh, that we're really dishonoring and disrespecting all of our ancestors that went before and really lived through some hard times and had to make some really hard sacrifices just for us to be here. It's like the, you put your kids and grandkids in debt. It's like that, only on the earth, it's like you poison places that can't be used anymore. It said nearly 50% of the applied material is still present in soil four to five months following application. Tordon K is another. The Active ingredient is pycloram. It's an endocrine disruptor. The uh, EPA says that eventual contamination of groundwater is virtually certain in areas where residues persist in the overlying soil. Misuse of chemicals, in, in, toxic chemicals, including herbicides, on our public lands affects our economies by reducing recreational opportunities by, by harming uh, non-target plant and animal and bird and fish species. And, and we, we shouldn't do that. We have to be very, very responsible when we're introducing toxic chemicals into our environment. on the road so we're gone a lot we're trying to run an organic garden in our yard and they just hop my fence spray their poison and then move along not cool yeah, hey, i know in texas you can shoot someone on your property i, I don't know about arkansas but... i went to the grocery store i said where do you keep your beer they said 40 miles here 
pretty uneducated about the whole thing. But then I realized how pervasive it is, man. They're in my backyard, you know? And then you start reading about it, and it's like, it's everywhere. And why, are, why are you spraying poison in everybody's backyard? And nobody wants it, so just stop doing it. All I want in this whole world is water I can drink. And is it too much to ask for air that doesn't stink? That's all I got to say to to me, what y'all are doing is counterproductive. There's been progress made. Uh, Lynn, one million, one million, one million, one million, fifteen years ago. I'm going to save it, Doug. Okay. Terry is absolutely right. Tremendous progress has been made because a new county wildlife service right. has been pushing the buttons and putting the pressure on for 16 years. The right. Arkansas it's not because we sit back and wait, it's because we keep putting the pressure on and telling what's going on. And many of your efforts on this issue are going to cause a backlash from other folks in the timber industry and all, and you're going to lose many of the things we've done right now. These demonstrators want the Forestry Service to stop the logging in the national, the Ozark National Forest in a watershed area for the Buffalo National River. Some environmentalists have confronted the logging operations in the woods during the past week. One of those protesters is Kent Bonnier. Last week we talked with Bonnier at a demonstration near a timber cutting area. Monday night, Bonnier was beaten by two men who came to his home. Environmentalists blamed the beating on the logging dispute. The men, who have been charged with third-degree battery, claimed the fight had nothing to do with a timber battle. The house got burned uh, the day that their parole was up. And, uh, yeah, oh, that things kind of went downhill from there. So I, that's why my place is like it is now, is because the house is gone, and, uh, you know, I'm having to make do with a, you know, with a trailer I got from a friend. Well, my, my other house was burned down in 91. Is that right? By arsonists. There was a house sitting right there. Your, what he had heard was that you were against incineration of Agent Orange? I, I had the largest library of technical information on incineration and related issues, you know, that anybody had, I know. The office burned at temperatures several times that of a normal house fire. They were on site for 15 minutes, and one of them came over and said, Miss Costner, did you have a fuel can in the middle of your living room floor? You know, the most truly pathetic, heart-rending thing of it was, it was all my children's, yeah. all my family pictures. All of them, I mean. with our legislators, we've talked to the public. Now is the time to make it a big issue and get some changes made immediately. Now! Well, people have dealt with nature and growing things and dealing with the natural world without herbicides for 99.99999% of human um, culture. So just recently, we have been inundated with the use of chemicals to try to control our environment. And I'm totally convinced that it has to do entirely with one thing, money. There's profit to be made in using them and making them and power to be had. And that's why they're Who used. Who forests belong to? Oh! Who needs to have a say in their management? Oh! We want our day in court. Administrative process doesn't work. The legal process is skewed. We've been to federal court. It's not a fair court. Make them pay through direct action and public outcry. Members contribute equitably to and democratic. Uh, 
and democratically control the capital of the cooperative. So they're just saying what a cooperative ought to be yeah. and how um, uh, and Care Electric uh, falls short on probably most, if not all, of those. What they're, what they're wanting to do now, if you sign off on this, is you are relinquishing your, your property rights. There is no liability to them. We are not a co-op. We have been co-opted. We have been cut out of it. You now have a private corporation run by the board members who elected themselves for seven years. A U.S. Senator only elected for six. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly the Father, we come to you from the great source. Electricity is everywhere, driving opportunity, contributing to the quality of life we all enjoy. Walk out here. From the Humble Hills, Carol Electric, serving 11 counties across the country, South and Southwest Missouri, has emerged as a Here's how our members had the opportunity to rank the priorities. The first uh, priority here that folks are interested in is low cost. Now, think about the question. The question is, not do I care about the environment, because we all care about the environment. All right, Tommy is going to spin our tumbler, and then we will draw uh, two names out, like I, to get started. Isn't that nifty, isn't it? Yeah. Howdy, I'm Curly. Um, I was hoping I wouldn't get called. I'm not a very eloquent speaker, but I'm uh, the partner or the husband of Carol Ann, and uh, we're, we have probably more liability issues with this than anyone. We're a very large farm. We do uh, 1,000 to 1,300 pounds of organically certified shiitake every week, 52 weeks a year. Uh, we love your guys. We know all of them. They always poke around the farm when they come out. They're great guys. You know, the crew that was out there, and I know the crew boss, they were lost. He was the spray crew. He was flustered. We had to go stop him. We had to go catch him on the road, or we'd have suffered the same fate as Kathy. And we'd now be in a huge lawsuit with you guys if you sprayed us and we became decertified. Um, I think one thing that hasn't been said here I'm also recovering from cancer. Uh, for the second time, I'm 50 pounds lighter than I should be. I'm on chemotherapy today as we're speaking. One thing that hasn't been said here is that, that this is a belief system. You know, you guys had us sit here and listen to a prayer. We've been organic our entire life. That's our belief system. You wouldn't want somebody to come in and force you to be Muslim or Buddhist. You know, you guys are Christians. Some of us might be, some of us might not. This is a belief system for us. We've lived this way our whole life. I was probably toxically damaged as a child drinking water from Lake Ontario full of mercury. My father was a dentist. He used to give me mercury to take to school to show kids. You know, I'm suffering right now from all of this. And I'd like you guys to consider that this is a belief system us. This isn't rocket science. You know, it's all about who, who has the strongest economic interest. And if you can't see something, you pour it on the ground, it disappears, it's not your problem anymore. And none of this is going to ever change unless we change the way our government is elected. <laughs> Any true co-op is actually run by its members. The members choose a board of directors like any other big business. The board tells the manager what to do and decides important questions by vote. They have complete control. Carroll Electric is a member-owned, not-for-profit, rural electric cooperative. These cooperatives came into being in the 1930s through the Rural Electrification Administration. I hear there's a new kind of power. Government. That's right. I hear there's an agency, rural electrification. There are no private investors, no profit making. 
you get power at cost. When the loan from the government to your cooperative is paid back through your electric bills, you and your neighbors will own your own electric system, your own lines. The Rochdale principles upon which cooperatives are based state that cooperatives are democratic organizations controlled by their members who actively participate in setting their policies and making decisions, and that elected representatives are accountable to the membership. I would like to see this be what it is, which is a co-op, which should be, which is a cooperative based on the road sailing principles, a democratic cooperative. And what we see here is positively anti-democratic. I mean, we have seen bylaws change with the, with the clear intent of limiting member participation in this alleged co-op. Now, as far as herbicides, Carroll Electric operates, as, the, as your map shows, in some 11 counties. Now, looking at your average easement width, I believe it's 30 to 60 feet, and the number of miles of line, Carroll Electric is probably the single lot con entity that controls the largest area of land in that 11 county. You control what happens on something like 40,000 acres of land. Now, if a significant portion of that it is subjected to herbicide use, you will be using an enormous amount of herbicides in what is almost surely entirely karst terrain. Where the where the groundwater is known to be extremely vulnerable. Now, I'm a scientist. I looked at Thank the you details. Pat. Thank you. I, the next one is Kim Jones. Whoa! What? We really don't know a whole lot about the toxicities of the, the ind individual ingredients. We know virtually nothing about the mixtures and what Progressive Solutions is doing under contract to Carroll Electric is applying a mixture of at least three of these herbicides. So before you could call and, and request to be put on a do not spray list, but now their response to all this public outcry about it has been to make it harder to get on a do not spray list. And now they have this um, form that you have to fill out and it has to be notarized. You have to have a, a, a copy of your deed attached and it says, when you apply to not be sprayed, it says the property owner understands and agrees that CECC may make reasonable effort to honor the request or CECC may deny request. However, in any event, there shall be no liability incurred for either CECC deliberately or unintentionally exercising easement rights. So now you have to say, oh, please don't spray me, but if you do, I'm giving up all rights to sue you for damages. And it says that requests to deviate from integrated procedures must be received at the cooperative offices by June 30th to be considered this year. If you have questions, please contact the cooperative. Well, we've talked to, to several people who, who don't even know what that means, requests to deviate from integrated procedures. Well, um, and I've spoken with three neighbors in the last few days who, do, who didn't understand what it meant, thought that all they had to do was put up a sign and they wouldn't be sprayed. And I, I asked my 80-year-old neighbor up the road if she would be willing to, to sign up for no spray, and she is, she's really concerned about herbicides and doesn't want them used on her property. But when I explained to her what was required, she said, oh, there's, there's no way I can do all that. And she didn't understand what had to be done, and once she did understand it, it was, it was totally overwhelming to her. And so most people, I think will either not know what has to be done or they, they won't be willing to jump through the hoops that Carroll Electric is requiring. And I think that's intentional. I think they're intentionally discouraging people from, from participating in the exemption program. By signing the agreement, you waive Carroll Electric of any liability for accidentally spraying. Uh, wh why is that? I mean, why would you ask members to waive, their liability, waive the liability? Well, 
and, and easement grants us the the uh, the right, so to speak, to maintain that power line, and, and landowner has granted us that easement. Okay, um, we uh, we need to re rephrase. Well, I'm sorry. It would be quite nice if the rest of y'all had farm. Uh, my farm was accidentally sprayed by Progressive Solutions eight months ago, and we have tried to resolve this conflict between Harold and and nobody will take responsibility for my livelihood. In our contract with them, it states that if there's an error made, they have the liability. So she has a beef with with uh, Progressive Solutions, which um, I don't know the, the knit and grit of this particular situation. Uh, we have a good contract with them. We have a good relationship with them. Uh, if, if we sprayed where we shouldn't have, you know, Maybe, I don't know what kind of amends that they have tried to work with her on. Um, I feel sure that they are trying to work with her and obviously they're not seeing eye to eye or because she was uh, very disappointed today in their actions and and uh, so she believes that Carol Electric, I think, should step in um, and back, progress, back her or, or, or help her with her um, issues and um, I guess our contract, you know, was with them so it wasn't with her. So are you saying if a mistake was made, it's the contractor's fault and not Carol Electric's? Well, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm saying that our contract said that they have the liability for it if they're the ones that sprayed it. So it's not Carol Electric's problem or fault or? Well, but that's a good question. That's a good point. You know, we, it, it's our easements and, and we have um, the responsibility to maintain them. And we're using herbicides as a, a part of our main, main, maintaining them. Um, you know, we've cut trees before, and we've been we've had members very unhappy, you know, cutting trees, and we've tried to replant a tree elsewhere. Um, we tried to work with folks that that feel like we have um, misused their property, and um, the liability goes. I guess I'm not a legal authority on it, but um, we try to make corrections where mistakes are done. So our, if our contract with, with Progressive Solutions says that if a mistake is made, you need to try to correct that mistake, um, you know, that's, that's kind of a binding contract. So tell me the question again. Well, I guess the, qu <laughs> the question, sorry. oh no, that's okay. Um, the question is, is Carol Electric saying, we're having a contractor spray these herbicides. So if they make a mistake and do damage, it's their fault and their problem, not Carol Electric's. If there's a written a written um, phrase in the contract for that, that's the way it needs to work. Yes. Is there a written phrase in the contract mm -hmm. for that? Mm -hmm. So that is with the way progressive. It, works. it is. Yeah. U.S. Okay. Progressive. They agree. I mean, yeah. they're trying to work with this with with this member. I know they are. So so Carol Electric can kind of wash its hands of well, liability. In a sense, although we we certainly you know don't want to our members unhappy. We we do want to maintain the easements. And that's why we hire a contractor. That's why we have somebody out there helping us maintain the easement. So, mm -hmm. you know, tough situation. Mistakes are made in day to day life. You know, mistakes are made. I regret it. I regret that she got accidentally sprayed. Well, she's out of business for three years on that part of well, her property. Do you know that for a fact? Uh, it's my understanding if you are organically certified and herbicides are detected, it takes you have to take it out of production for have four they, years. Have they met with her certification? That's my understanding. I'll have to find out for okay. sure. See, I don't know either. Yeah. It makes it very hard. We only have two minutes to talk. I can use the 20 minutes myself. <laughs> uh, they started off with uh, the last veg base they had for the Forest Service. They started out with a whole bunch of uh, pesticides that they could use, and, and uh, now they're only down to two because all the others have been pulled off the market or, or taken away because of bad effects. These aren't accidents. This is how the thing goes. They put out the material. Okay, sir. Thank you. That's it. I feel confident that once the, the, the tree is dead, the, the herbicide becomes inert. And, um, you know, we have... No? <laughs> well... No, not, these, not the herbicides you're using. No. The, well, the inerts, of course, are not inert. Right. I mean, nonalphenol is a well-known endocrine disruptor. Right. I mean, notorious, mm -hmm. notorious. And it's labeled as inert. Yes. Yeah. Well. The EPA registers a pesticide 
and absolutely says that doesn't mean it's safe. You know, our electric uh, utility was cited by the EPA saying that their letters uh, announcing to their membership that they were going to be applying products to enhance the growth of low-growing shrubs and grasses was false and misleading. And that it was safe for humans and animals was false and misleading. You know, the EPA specifically stated they do not endorse these products as safe for humans or pets even if the label directions are followed. While electric cooperatives claim that their use of herbicides reduces costs, this assertion does not hold up under scrutiny. It is much more expensive when all costs are included in the analysis. The costs of compliance with EPA label requirements, the costs of insurance for possible injury from exposure, training spray crews in the science of karst geology, walking each organic farm's fence lines to document where not to spray, contacting each household who requests to not be sprayed. They're putting all this uh, stuff in the notification letter they send out to everybody, which actually costs $40,000 to send out a notification letter to everybody just because they're spraying the herbicides. They're not factoring in the hidden costs of contaminating an aquifer, for example. Those are called externalities, and economists don't deal with externalities. Those are hypothetical questions that you can't put a dollar amount on, and so they ignore them. Okay, I think we are ready now for Nancy. I've got to say something before this gets started. 22 years I worked in the Department of Agriculture, and I've never seen anything like this. Nancy, you know, you're a chemist, but you're not a chemist. You're 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 a chemist. you For me, it's an issue of it's not organic or non-organic, it's just, it's just clean water. And I think people have a right to know, um, to be educated about the beautiful area that we live in, the karstic features, and the shallow wells, and the recharge zones, and the springs, and I just don't think people understand the nature of these herbicides, and I don't think the Board of Directors understands the nature of these herbicides. So I think people just need to be more informed. And I think once they are, and if, they, if people were told what type of herbicides were being sprayed and to the extent that they're being sprayed, I think people would have a different, different feeling about this. Because I think most our, our Kansans love the Ozarks, and they do anything they could to protect it. This issue is not limited to the Ozarks. In fact, electric cooperatives are aggressively applying herbicides throughout the United States. have a society, but it's not hooked up with nature properly, so we don't really have a culture. We can't depend on the society we have to take us through and to, and to provide for our offspring for generations to come, because we're not teaching them how to, to work with nature. If we were, we, we would, there would be a lot more hope, there would be a lot more happiness, there would be more music and singing, it would be a, a, a better place to live. We wouldn't have to protect our children so much from the, from the chaos and, 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 and corruption that, that the, uh, uh, a society not hooked up to nature brings. Mm -hmm. Everything is hitched to everything else in the universe. And this is a, a part of that pattern. The Newton County Wildlife Association's active leadership is getting older. And while they appreciate the opportunity to fight on your behalf to ensure that there remains at least one clean, pristine place left in the United States where a human can still take a drink from a stream and not become ill, the time has come. The Newton County Wildlife Association and other advocates for environmental health around the country need assistance. Yeah,
Yeah. Anyway, we investigated a report. Exactly, and that's what we got to be doing. They need assistance with on-the-ground documentation of cases where greed and blind belief in technology override common sense. We need to hear more about the many good examples that are out there. I had truckloads of Carroll Electric guys coming out here really excited about this and wanting to see it. And I mean, it, it was, you know, they were happy about it. It oh. follows the sun all day long and it works through magic. I really think the changes that we need to make as, as a species, you know, have to begin at the individual level. Mm -hmm. I really do. But I don't think the majority of individuals are willing, able, or ready to do that. But you have to be willing to be an example yeah. and to show people that it's possible. I think the bioregional movement has the answer. Okay, okay, what is the nature of our natural region? How do you define it? And what would we do here in order to live sustainably? That word sustainability is really the root of what the bioregional idea is all about. We have the trees, we have the water, we have this wildlife, we have this soil that the forest made. How do we figure out how to live here indefinitely and not destroy the place? That's all it is. It's just common sense. And it just so happens that following how nature would manage the land is the way that we need to imitate. You know, on the forest that I manage, we don't use any biocides I don't believe I don't believe in, in, in the use of it, uh, because it is it has unknown effects yeah. in forestry it's called vegetative management we are thinning the forest and we're doing it mechanically uh, by hand we don't make selection of trees that we cut down or thin on based on commercial criteria we do it in order to enhance the health of the forest which over the long period of time we believe is a is a good economic decision Water sculpted this whole thing, created this whole thing. The soils we have are mostly created by the forest, called the forest soil. The forest is what we got here. The forest loves it here. Oak loves it here. I don't know why. You cut down the forest around here and the oaks come out. You can see it on maps and it has its own culture. There's not really a Missouri Ozark culture in an Arkansas Ozark culture. And why is that? Because the bioregion itself influenced how people live and how they have to live. And even if mainstream media and politics prevent widespread sustainability, there are just so many more rational ways of controlling vegetation than spraying poisons. You could use livestock to clear. Goats will eat anything. For thousands of years, farmers have used livestock to clear overgrown, unwieldy sections of land. You could have useful wild plants like echinacea, that grow in the region naturally, propagated in the right of ways. You could have low growing fruit trees and shrubs, like blueberries, or bike and ATV trails. And of course, they could always maintain the lines as they have for over 70 years with manual clearing.
politicians, shifty crooked jackals by the definition, them creepy politicians full of ambitions by the definition. I can drink.